So RSV season will be arriving uh, soon. Um, and you might have heard about the FDA approving a new drug or vaccine for children to prevent RSV. Today's episode, we're going to talk a little bit more about that drug, which is called Bifortis, and about RSV itself. Welcome to the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. As a pediatrician and mother herself, Dr. Rolnick is here to answer your most pressing parenting questions and guide you through the tough spots. Good morning. Welcome back to Be Kind Pediatrics. Today, we're going to be talking about a very exciting medical breakthrough in pediatrics that is by Fortis or the RSV um, vaccination. So one of our first episodes we did with Dr. Stephen Gowdery, the um, creator of the NoseBot, and we were talking about bronchiolitis and upper respiratory tract hygiene. And we talked in that episode a little bit about the number one cause of bronchiolitis, and that is RSV. So I'm going to just do a quick little bit refresher on what RSV is, what it causes, and why we care so much about it in pediatrics. So RSV is an respiratory tract virus. It is the number one cause of bronchiolitis. So what is bronchiolitis exactly? Bronchiolitis is a lower respiratory tract infection and is specifically more severe in small children and the elderly. Some upper respiratory tract infections like RSV can climb down our respiratory tract and infect our lower respiratory tract or our lower airways. This is a particular problem for children because their lower airways are so much smaller. So if you think of the adult airway as a big straw, a pediatric or an infant airway might be the size of a sipping straw. So you can imagine if your straw gets a little bit swollen or collapses a little bit, um, and it's a big straw, you can still suck fluid through that straw without a problem. If you have a, like a stirring straw sized airway and it becomes edematous or swollen, trying to pull fluid for that then becomes very difficult. And that's kind of analogous to the um, lower airway tract of a small infant. So when RSV goes from an upper respiratory tract infection then begins to infect the lower respiratory tract, we call that bronchiolitis. And it's really a threefold problem. One, it's mucus production in those small airways, um, edema of those small airways, and eventually that leads to collapse of those smallest airways. Those are called the alveoli, and that alveoli are where oxygen is actually exchanged. So when you have a bunch of them collapsed, you can have difficulty with oxygen exchange, um, and that can lead to hypoxemia or low oxygen in the blood. And it can also lead to respiratory distress, um, which really looks like in a small infant that fast belly breathing, the spaces between their ribs going in and out, tugging here at the trachea or their, knees, their nose flaring in and out. Those would all be signs of respiratory distress. So how is RSV spread? It's spread by respiratory droplets. So either coughing or sneezing or touching a contaminated surface. So who's at the highest risk for RSV? Again, that's the very small children. So definitely those less than 12 months, but particularly those less than six months, um, or those up to two years who have underlying cardiopulmonary vascular disease that puts them at higher risk when they get a lower respiratory tract infection and or bronchiolitis. So how is RSV bronchiolitis treated? To date, the only treatment for RSV bronchiolitis is really supportive care, meaning there's no Um, drug-specific treatment for RSV. What we do is we try to support children um, and their breathing and their hydration while they recover and fight the illness. So that might be if a child's in really respiratory distress, supporting their breathing with either positive pressure ventilation or maybe just a little extra supplemental oxygen if they're hypoxic. It might be IV fluids if they're dehydrated or if they're in respiratory distress and can't eat. Um, And so it's kind of just managing all of the complications of RSV bronchiolitis rather than a specific drug designed to treat or get rid of RSV bronchiolitis. So why is it particularly relevant now? Um, So the CDC just let out an advisory warning for clinicians um, letting us know that we can expect RSV potentially to be a little seasonably earlier this year. That um, continues with trends that we were seeing during um, the COVID pandemic. So traditionally or historically what we see is that RSV begins in the southern United States areas and then it travels north and west over the period of a couple, um, two to three months usually. Um, Usually we see RSV peak in late fall, kind of mid-winter. This year the CDC is letting us know that we've already started to see 
um, RSV in the southern United States. So we can expect that over the next three to four months, or two to three months, sorry, that we will begin to start to see RSV um, in the north in the northeast, um, which is a little bit earlier than we traditionally see RSV season. So Bifortis is kind of seasonably this year also a very exciting that it is planning to be released. So what is Bifortis? I've been talking a lot about it. Bifortis is FDA approved as a drug, actually not a vaccine, um, for RSV. Um, and the way that it works is it's a monoclonal antibody. Um, and that means that it is designed to provide immediate but short-term protection. It does not induce long-term immunologic memory. Um, so this is a drug or a vaccine, if you'd like, that will really work for just that particular season. And it's a monoclonal antibody designed to bind to or attach to the F protein um, on RSV virus. That binding prevents the RSV virus from entering our cells. Um, so again, it provides immediate relief, but short-term um, protection against RSV. It's really meant to protect the smallest children at their most vulnerable time, which is their first and potentially their second RSV season. So I think that plays a little bit into the CDC's recommendation for who they are recommending, recommending get um, by Fortis. So really the CDC is recommending any infant less than eight months entering their first RSV season that they get it at the beginning of the season, which is looking like this year, it's going to be, you know, really October potentially um, to get it at the beginning of October or as soon as it's possibly available. Bifortis is being manufactured or produced by Sanofi or AstraZeneca. Um, and so they have just started accepting pre-orders for it. So we're all really hoping that we are going to get our orders before the RSV season begins um, in the Northeast area. The recommendation also extends to any children who are born during RSV season that they get by Fortis either in the hospital before they leave or shortly thereafter. After eight months, the recommendation is between eight and eight and 19 months. Those who have increased risk for severe RSV infection, that's going to be those children again with cardiac and pulmonary disease, that they receive um, by Fortis immunization as well um, during the RSV season. So again, that's going to be eight month olds, everybody under eight months and older who is entering the RSV season, or those between eight and 19 months who are at risk for more severe disease. That's the CDC's recommendations for Bifortis. The FDA, however, has approved Bifortis for children less than 24 months entering their RSV season. So what's the actual efficacy of Bifortis? The vaccine was studied in three double-blind randomized control trials. The notice notable are going to be phase two and phase three clinical trials, which enrolled about 3,000 children, 3,000 to 4,000 children. Of those 3,500 children-ish, um, half of them were going to be greater than 35 weeks, and half of them were between 29 and 35 weeks old who received by Fortis. So the primary endpoint that the study was looking at, or what, what kind of they were trying to prove was how they were trying to see a reduction in um, medically attended lower respiratory tract infections due to the RSV infection. So medically attended was defined as um, presenting to any healthcare center that might be an urgent care, an ER, a pediatrician's office. The secondary outcome that they were looking at was hospitalization rates due to lower tract, lower respiratory tract infections due to RSV. And what they found was a 74.7% relative risk reduction in medically attended lower respiratory tract infections due to RSV. And their secondary outcome, which was hospitalizations, they found a 62% reduction in hospitalization rates due to lower respiratory tract infections from RSV. Um, however, the p-value was 0.07, which means it was clinically, um, statistically not significant. So of the children, about six children who had um, received by Fortis wound up hospitalized with lower respiratory tract infections related to RSV, and eight who did not receive it wound up hospitalized with lower respiratory tract infections due to RSV. So the next thing we're going to talk about was what is the safety of the vaccine? Um, and so the most common side effect that was seen that with this was injection site reaction, so a little erythema or tenderness at the site of the injection. So the FDA did approve by Fortis as a drug, not a vaccine, but it's delivered in a very similar mechanism to vaccines, meaning it's an intramuscular shot. 
So the most common reaction um, was a rash or an injection site reaction. And actually the side effect was seen higher in the placebo group than in the bifortis group. But those were, that were, those were the two most common side effects. So there are a few contraindications, meaning children who absolutely should not receive bifortis. The first contraindication is a child who's had hypersensitivity reactions to any component of the bifortis injection. Um, so hypersensitivity reaction, an example of that might be something like anaphylaxis. The second group of children who should not receive the bifortis vaccination are children with um, severe bleeding disorders because it is an intramuscular shot or an injection. Children who have severe bleeding disorders should not receive this medication. Another common question has, is it compatible with other vaccines? So it has been studied and there's no contraindication to giving bifortis with the other routine um, recommended childhood vaccinations. So the last kind of thing to talk about is um, the implementation or what we foresee the implementation being of bifortis. So currently right now, although we're hoping um, insurance reimbursement for bifortis is not, we're not 100% sure about that. The drug is going to be sold at about $495 a, a shot, um, and some of which, or hopefully all of which, may or may not be covered by um, health insurance. So right now, for the private sector, it's going to come out at about $495 to $500 um, a treatment. And each child is going to require one treatment per season, for, at least for their first season, and potentially up to their second RSV season, depending on how old they are entering that second season. I encourage people who are considering or would like to get the Bifortis injection for their child, reaching out proactively to your insurance company um, and seeing what the coverage might look like for this treatment. Um, and then I also just want to talk about other strategies for reducing RSV infection besides bifortis. So what do we have in our toolkit currently? Currently, we know that RSV is spread by, the, I said, those contact droplet, respiratory droplets or contact. So really good hand washing when anybody is holding your infant or coming near your infant, have them wash their hands um, appropriately before touching them. Anytime you go in or out of the house, um, wash your hands really well, again, if anybody is sick or showing signs of a lower respiratory or upper respiratory tract infection, which would be fever, sneezing, cough, um, chills, myalgia, having them avoid your child until they are fully recovered. There have been some interesting studies looking at at least COVID and improved ventilation, potentially reducing the risk of transmission. So just making sure that your vents in your house are clean, that you maybe have a... Um, HIPAA filter if you're uh, sharing space with other young children who might be prone to getting um, sick, like school-aged kids who are in school, for example. And then now adding to our toolbox, again, by Fortis for those youngest children, um, as well as the two new FDA-approved vaccines for adults, so trying to get a little bit of herd immunity and, and decreasing the spread that way. So just kind of to recap, since we're reviewing a new drug, I think the first question is, um, what is the drug for? Why do we care about it? Um, does it work? Is it safe? And can we actually implement it? So again, what it's for is for RSV bronchiolitis. Why we care is because RSV bronchiolitis is still the leading cause for hospitalization of children and the main cause of morbidity and mortality um, for otherwise healthy children in the United States. The efficacy seems to be pretty good. Again, a 75% relative risk reduction in medically attended lower respiratory tract infections due to RSV. Um, the safety, again, it seems like it's going to wind up being, a, at least from the short-term um, side effects, injection site reactions um, and erythema. So it seems like it will be a relatively safe drug. And then implementation, I think we're still unsure about how insurance is going to go about reimbursing and covering this drug. Um, but it will be costing the private sector about $500 a treatment. And again, it's going to be one treatment for the first season and potentially second treatment, depending on your child and their age entering their second RSV season. As a healthcare provider for children, I'm really excited that we're moving in a direction where we are hopefully going to be protecting um, infants from RSV bronchiolitis. Um, and so I'm very excited to be able to add Bifortis potentially to our toolbox and repertoire. If you have any questions or concerns, please reach out or leave a comment below. We'd love to hear from you.
Thank you for watching the Beehive Doc Talks with Dr. Blair Rolnick. For more episodes and her practice, visit BeKindPediatrics.com and don't forget to subscribe for more parenting tips wherever you get your podcasts. This information is for educational purposes only. It is not medical advice. Always seek medical advice from a qualified physician.